as you've been talking about a lot on this show, like the the um, that is data, and we information is how we interpret data. Mm -hmm. But data is just the ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. So at its core, Bitcoin is not digital gold or an asset or even money. It's it's just a string of ones and zeros mm. that enables us to interact with one 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 another in such a way so we get this fixed set of rules mm. that is extremely hard to change unless we all agree that we should change it for some reason. Right. And so so it's it, so it's all logos basically. Mm. It's based around absolute you know, game theory and mathematics. Mm -hmm. And that is what enables us to to get these layers of the mythos and the ethos on top. Like mm -hmm. the ethics and everything mm -hmm. are derived from that we now have this base layer of absolute truth mm -hmm. because we define truth by whatever happened in the time chain. So so I think that is yeah. Yeah, it's it's mind blowing. Yeah, right? yeah. What what did we create here? Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Knut von Holm, welcome back to the What Is Money Show. Thanks a lot, Robert. Nice to be back. Glad to have you back. I'm holding in my hands your latest book. Yeah. The fourth? Yeah. The first one that isn't necessarily about Bitcoin. Right. So you've written three about Bitcoin. Yeah. And this one is about praxeology, the topic. Yes. Which is... The Study of Human Action. Yes. And your subtitle here is The Invisible Hand That Feeds You. Yes. One of my favorite topics. I yes, I know. I've Some might say it's the hand of God. Yes, I might say that. <laughs> I'm not one of those. <laughs> what uh, Can you tell us a little bit about your inspiration for writing this book and what what it's about? Some, uh, some of it, your show is, is one of my inspirations for writing oh, this book you. like so uh especially the episodes with max hillebrand mm -hmm. and and uh, stefan kinsella mm -hmm. and people like that talking about praxeology mm -hmm. but even before that like bitcoin was my gateway drug to press praxeology that, yeah, like same. how i uh, fell into that rabbit hole and like you i just devoured praxeology books afterwards because the once once you have that mindset uh you just keep keep on exploring that because it's such an interesting topic because it's not taught in schools or at least not in public schools mm -hmm. um, for for a very good reason um, 
I guess, because it sort of obsoletes the the, the notion of a public school or anything public uh -huh. if you deep dive deep enough. Yeah. So I think it was you that told me, uh, like we had a conversation about it and you said uh, praxeology is to the subjective what mathematics is to the objective. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect framing. So I... Uh, I use that in... Yeah, it's right here on the back of the book. You said, what yeah. if there were a school subject as crucial as mathematics that no one ever told you about? Yeah. What if public schooling itself was a product of people's lack of knowledge about this subject? Yes. What if the social sciences weren't really sciences at all, but veiled propaganda? <laughs> and what if logic and deductive reasoning alone could provide more robust explanations for people's actions than empiricism ever could? Yeah. And so it's... Yeah, we... I think most people believe that science is empiricism, like they are the one and the yes. same. Empir empiricism being we observe certain patterns across time yeah. and then we derive a, a law or principle from that. Right? Yes. And rationalism would be kind of the inversion of that, right? Like we start with a law or principle that then is a an explanatory framework for the things we observe. Yeah. In reality. I would say rationalism is a prerequisite for empirical sciences as well. Yeah. So like... Theory precedes observation. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. So, so uh, which is very, very useful. And like, we shouldn't like deny the, the usefulness of empiricism just because we know... Of course not. ...know about a priori right. thinking. But, it, but it's, uh, it's very important to remember that the map can never be the territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is deductive reasoning is is like uh, it's n not even trying to draw a map. <laughs> I guess it's it it's just it's just that logical deduction, and it, it, things have to be this way because arguing against it is self contradictory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is a great one. Um, I love this introduction actually because you're. <laughs> One of the axioms of Austrian economics is man must act. Yeah, it's the first one. There's a lot contained in that little tiny phrase. Yeah. Um, man, humans, yeah. must, like, it's unavoidable, it's by necessity, it's the yeah. only thing we can, not the only thing we can do, but we we must do to, sur to survive in the world. Yeah. And then act is the purposeful use of means to pursue chosen ends. Exactly. And we, to try and argue against that, right, to try, that's called the yeah. axiom of action or yeah, typically called the axiom of action, to try and propose a counter argument to that would be to use the means of argumentation to pursue the ends of refuting exactly. the axiom of action. Therefore, it is axiomatic and that it cannot even be refuted. No, it's self-contradictory. Right, yeah. to even try and refute the argument. So therefore, it becomes like this foundational presupposition to the entire economic to every science of economics. Uh, yeah. yeah. The uh, science of human action. When, if I was to try to dispute the man must act uh, axiom, it would be that a, a human being could just be acting on instinct all the time. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of, is that even a human being? <laughs> a, 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 right. a, a creature that does that? Like the, the only thing that sort of Separates rationality. Right? Yeah, and th that separates us from from beasts is that we act deliberately and mm -hmm. with intent. So, so, uh, so it's a very important distinction because, like, as soon as a creature does that, uh, that you can observe that this creature is acting out of its own free will. Uh, ethics come into play. Like mm -hmm. that's someone you have to, uh, or. Uh, I wouldn't. I shouldn't say have to, but that's someone who who you could interact with uh, peacefully and yeah. therefore be civilized with, and hence the word civilization. Like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. It's something about people. That word purpose is very key, right? That we're aiming at something. A purposeful behavior, right? And then we're choosing different means to pursue and fulfill that purpose. Yeah. And now, once you have that realization. There's the possibility of people coming to cross purposes, which is like, yeah. I want the thing and you want the thing. Yeah. Like, are we going to fight over it or are we going to yeah. have some type of other way to arbitrate the dispute, you know, property rights or whatever it may yeah. be. And so 
there therein lies the need for ethics, right? It's like how do we resolve the cross purposes? Yeah, with all these different people acting on purpose, doing a lot of different things, there's inherently going to be conflict. We have to have an ethical system to resolve that, deal with that. Absolutely. Uh, well, we don't have to have it. We could just you could just fight. Yeah, yeah. we could just fight over stuff. Yeah. And be irrational. Yes. And I wouldn't want to choose that type of interaction costly. with you, for instance. Right. <laughs> it would be more costly to everyone like. <laughs> to just fight over everything versus having the ethical framework, yes. which actually benefits everyone. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it, it can be hard for someone who has a uh, an advantage in, 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 pure, in, in pure physical power or weapons and stuff, an mm-hmm. aggressor. Uh, it can be hard for that individual to see that not choosing to do that but choosing to engage in catalactic competition rather than biological competition yeah. would benefit them as well yes and this is also uh sort of i i <laughs> like i avoided writing about bitcoin in this book but it immediately takes me to bitcoin territory because i think that's one of the 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 most underrated aspects of what Bitcoin does is that it's it's sort of it makes biological competition even less uh, profitable. So mm. if I threaten you and I say, Rob, give me all your bitcoins, or I'll use this five dollar wrench to kill you, mm-hmm. or yeah, um, ten dollar wrench, yeah, ten dollar <laughs> wrench, twenty one dollar wrench. Per. Anyway, uh, then. You can choose to give me a fraction of your Bitcoin, and I can never know how much you actually had. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is true for every single human being on Earth right now. Mm-hmm. I cannot know how much Bitcoin another uh, human being is in possession of. Uh, which means that you've moved the shelling point of the profit- profitability for violent behavior. Mm-hmm. And what, one of the things we hear about in the Bitcoin space a lot is when it's just this $10 wrench attack. Uh, and uh, what about that? And uh, you're, you're at risk because you're a public Bitcoiner and uh, someone can uh, do chain analysis and do all, all this and do all that. Mm-hmm. And I think I, what's missing from that debate is that fiat is optimized for that. Mm-hmm. That's going on at all times. You're paying for the ten dollar wrench that they're using to to threaten you to take your stuff, right? And there's nothing the re- you can do about the it. wrench is built into the money. Yeah, the, the, you're paying for the wrench. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> I mean, the money itself is the wrench, right? Yeah, like, exactly. Central banking exactly. is like just control P. They yeah, debased you. Yeah, right. and uh, if you don't pay your taxes, they come with guns and and yeah. throw you in prison. So, yeah. like at the end of the line, it can be hard to see because it's convoluted, right? The path to yeah. to prison from just trying to be free. <coughs> oh, sorry. Mm. It's all right. Uh, but that's what it is. Mm. Uh, so so that's, I, I think that's a, like the correct framing of this problem. And for people that this might sound confusing to, I think, again, mathematics gives us a very useful kind of comparative. Mm-hmm. Um, mathematics is clearly not an empirical science, right? We don't... No. You don't go out into the world and test, like actually experiment and test that all parallel lines never touch, right? No. It's an assumption you make in Euclidean geometry, for instance, right? And then from that assumption, you build the actual body of knowledge that is Euclidean geometry, right? The, um, yeah. Triangles contain 180 degrees, yeah, yeah. parallel lines never touch, yeah. et cetera. These basic axiomatic assumptions, yeah. are the foundation on which you deduce everything else. Yeah. This is going out and observing. And this is epistemology, right? Yes. Uh, methodology. Right. And there's an even deeper science than mathematics that governs that called logic, uh-huh. uh, which is like the... Because mathematics didn't start in, with empiricism, I guess. Mm-hmm. So like You still have to make observations about the surroundings, or about your surroundings, and to come to these conclusions, you could... If you were born in... Uh, uh, a barrel. <laughs> uh, you w- you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't necessarily be able to do the deductive reasoning necessary because you would yeah. have no points of reference. Right. So so it's intertwined with the real world and what we observe in it as well. Yeah. Even though that the methodology, the Austrian methodology, that's that's the key difference that we instead of uh, you know 
uh, praxeology admits that empiricism uh, can neither prove nor disprove any of these uh, anything in economics, right. really. Right. So even if you have a, a study of the however many people in however many countries, it can't really tell you anything about what was actually going on. Right. And uh, yeah, so you ha- you're forced to use deductive reasoning uh, because otherwise your 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 science is flawed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. The other uh, thing that's usually useful here, I think, for people is when you look at the natural sciences. For instance, water always freezes at zero degrees centigrade. Yeah. Boil, boils at a hundred. Right. There's a constant relationship there that no one can really change or do anything about it's something we discovered in nature now obviously we assigned this measurement system yeah centigrade that's but, true but for a certain pressure for a certain pressure yeah. right sure but the constancy of those relations is what lets what allows empiricism to function in a way whereas you don't have any such constancy in the sphere of human relations right no exactly each situation is different each right. evaluation of something is different each right. pressure is different so the epistemology of, of an empirical epistemology is proper to natural sciences like physics. Yes, because but improper to social sciences. Yeah, because empiricism is is not trying to. Uh, I mean, it's it's trying to to draw a map, mm-hmm. but it's always aware of the map not being sufficient, like a, a, an accurate re- uh, description of reality, mm-hmm. since. Uh, uh, since a, a, a precise map would have to be the universe itself, uh-huh. so so the territory, the, the territory, yeah. and this is now we go into GG territory here because like in Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is the first time that where the map defines the territory. Mm-hmm. So so in Bitcoin, whatever we end up coming to consensus around is the correct next block becomes that next block. Uh-huh. So whatever. Uh, so reality in Bitcoin is defined by whatever happened in the time chain. Right. Uh, and the, also an, an aspect of it I find extremely fascinating. Like that's the first time that ever happened. Yeah, it's like a self-contained universe, right? Yeah. So yeah. The, the map or the, the logical construct that we have created. Yeah. And then what are we doing? We are um, creating the logical construct, but then bringing it into reality through social consensus, maybe something like that. So it's the map actually yes. is the territory. They're one and the same. It's it def- a- it defines the map defines the territory. It's recursive in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all predicated on human action. So I, yeah. I would say like Bitcoin is not backed by energy. It's backed by human action. Mm. Sure. Humans, Which is backed by energy. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Humans need energy to act. Yeah. But, uh, but every every aspect of it requires a human being making a deliberate decision, mm-hmm. and it's set up in such a way that it's cheaper to follow the rules than to try to break them. Right, and that's why it works. And that's the key. Yeah. yeah. So that's the key. So so every every Bitcoin user uh, is a deliberate actor. Like the mm-hmm. Bitcoin is used whenever it's used, if, even either if it's used for. Uh, as a medium of exchange or as a savings vehicle or whatever mm-hmm. you use your Bitcoin for, mm-hmm. leveraging your internet fame. I mean, right. that's a that's a Bitcoin use case mm-hmm. as well uh, from a certain perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every node runner, like the the node is not the Raspberry Pi running Ambro or the, uh, you know, Start9 server or the uh, Bitcoin core program on your old laptop. It's It's the person who decides to use that. Because if you think about what a computer actually is, it's just uh, a very fancy abacus. Mm-hmm. It's a tool with a very specific purpose. It's it helps us calculate. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's a tool for calculation. So it's a, so it's a fancy calculator. That's mm-hmm. that's all it is. I, I would say my my computer identifies as non-binary mm-hmm. because it shows me stuff on my screen. That is that doesn't look binary. It looks mm-hmm. like pictures. It looks like I I hear sounds from it. Right. Uh, I can do all sorts of communication via that thing, but at its core, there's no such thing as non-binary. It's binary. very very right. binary. Right. So so this is as you've been talking about a lot on this show, like the the um, that is data, and we 
information is how we interpret data. Mm -hmm. But data is just the ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. So at its core, Bitcoin is not digital gold or an asset or even money. It's it's just a string of ones and zeros mm. that enables us to interact with one, one, one another in such a way so we get this fixed set of rules mm. that is extremely hard to change unless we all agree that we should change it for some reason. Right. And so so it's it, so it's all logos basically mm. it's based around absolute you know game theory and mathematics mm -hmm. and that is what enables us to to get these layers of the mythos and the ethos on top like mm. the ethics and everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are derived from that we now have this base layer of absolute truth mm -hmm. because we define truth by whatever happened in the time chain so so i think that's yeah yeah, it's it's mind blowing. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, what what did we create here? Um, discover, discover, <laughs> create, invent. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's hard hard to say. Um, okay, so first chapter in your book is action, and we were talking, yeah. and again, it's one of those words that for praxeology would just kind of take for granted. Maybe it's like, yeah, of course, yeah. humans act like, yeah, everything I do, I'm kind of moving through the world, but. Yeah, but that distinction between action and behavior, right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas action is purposeful, behavior is reflexive. Yeah, or conditioned, yeah. instinctual. Yeah. Um, we were talking offline uh, before we started to get about this distinction between holding and saving. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I wonder if we can unpack that a little bit and see how it relates yeah. to to human action. Yeah, that's an interesting topic. I mean. Um, Saving is a very deliberate action. What you're doing in saving capital, capital is necessary for economic pro progress. Like mm -hmm. the, the very basic Robinson Crusoe example is that Robinson Crusoe is running around catching fish with his hands. And if he wants to be able to catch fish at a faster rate, he will need to construct a fishing net or a fishing rod or mm -hmm. something. So and in order to do that he needs to he needs a stock of fish to survive during the process in which he's constructing the net or the rod. So he needs to save capital for the future. The fish here being capital. Mm -hmm. Anything can be capital. Mm -hmm. Like so so it's a prerequisite for advancement, civilizational advancement. Um so and what it is is delayed gratification. Now in terms of money, uh Money is never idle. Uh, it's it's always of some use to someone. Mm -hmm. So if you have a huge stock of capital, there are a lot of you have less worries than if you have nothing. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need to worry about finding food and shelter. Right. And as an extension of that, if you have a lot of money, you, there's a lot of other things you don't need to worry about. If you're financially free, you you can choose not to work every day. And like you know. Uh, so, so saving in that sense is a very deliberate human hack action. Now, hodling it depends on how you define define hodling, but but there's a, I think there's some some very interesting aspects of that 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 are novel in terms of human action because uh, hodling Bitcoin can be a de deliberate action, mm -hmm. but doesn't necessarily have to be. I mean, if you write your seed phrase down and then you die, you didn't have the intention of dying, so the the, the initial saving may may have been a, a deliberate action. Mm -hmm. But then that Bitcoin exists within that seed phrase still after you're gone, and then that piece of paper or that uh, metal plate or whatever you have it on, then that's the thing that is hodling the Bitcoin. So that's like, and it's it's kind of hard to define because. Without a human actor acting upon that, right. like using that seed for for something in the future, yeah, that object can't do anything. Yeah. It, it can't do anything without uh, without well, being acted action. upon. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but, but, what is? Can you still say that the the stone or the piece of paper or the metal plate is hodling Bitcoin? There are bitcoins on it. Like, what's right. the? And this is a semantics thing yeah. that we, I think we should like try to define these terms. Uh, because yeah. there there are subtle differences between, uh, and as you know, like all the analogies and metaphors in Bitcoin are are insufficient, mm -hmm. at least insufficient, because they're not comparable really to anything else that we had before Bitcoin. That's right. So, yeah. 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 This yeah, there's a number of things here. You know, the insufficiency of language 
something I've been very stuck on recently is like how obviously indispensable language is to being human and being civilized and being rational, right? Yeah. Like we're running cognitive software that is denominated in language. If communication is the, uh, we have two ways of resolving any conflict and one is violence and the other is communication. Right. So that's why we need no language. Contract or yeah. conflict kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yet, as indispensable as language is to human rationality, mm -hmm. ethics, all this, all science, everything we're discussing here, thinking, mm -hmm. it's also simultaneously and perhaps equally insufficient and in that the map is never the territory as we've been describing. Exactly. So uh, quite oftentimes, if not all the time, every time there seems to be an argument or a disagreement on a particular point, it's people assigning or ascribing slightly different meaning to words. Exactly. Right? Like I had a Twitter argument recently with, with Giacomo and it was like legitimate is it, or uh, the ordinals and inscriptions use of Bitcoin. Is that legitimate or illegitimate? Yeah. And my point was that legitimacy is a matter of law, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, is it legitimate or illegitimate in the eyes of the law? Yeah. And if Bitcoin code is law, then it's like there is no illegitimate so long as it conforms mm -hmm. to the rules. Yeah. And I think he was making more of a moral legitimacy case. Yeah, like, yeah, natural law. Yeah, it's like you can use this stuff and do these things, but it's like not morally good. And it's like, okay, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. But, but again, it was just the crux of the argument or conversation was the meaning we each ascribe to the word legitimate. I was taking yeah. more of a legal frame on it. He was taking more or of an ethical one. Yeah, exactly. So, and it seems like most arguments are like that. Yeah, but I think these these fads that are uh, on the time chain at the moment, like filling it up with arbitrary mm -hmm. data, like the monetary use case will always be, uh, in the end, that will become more valuable than whatever thing you put on the time chain. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a costly hobby that may fool a person or two now mm -hmm. because like, all right, a bit of a rant about the, the whole notion of that Bitcoin is uh, all, all it is is human beings. Mm -hmm. So if, if I memorize a seed phrase, then I, uh, and I destroy every other location that that seed phrase is in, uh, then I am that Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But if you think a bit deeper about that, you realize that all bitcoins are like you have ownership, which is a legal framework. Like right. I own something, uh, and you, if you're in possession of that, if another person is in possession of that thing I own, that person can choose not to give it back to me. Yeah, which is what central banks are doing, have been doing to to third world countries for many centuries. Like, right. oh, you're not getting your gold back, and so. Yeah. But bitcoin is a, I, I think. I, the correct way to look at it, it's like an even deeper layer of possession than possession itself, because it li all lives within someone's head. Whoever, not your keys, not your coins, means that they they are all within us. They're all within our heads, which in turn means that we are the Bitcoin. There's mm -hmm. no clear line between our minds and the Bitcoins that they reside within them. <laughs> all right. Uh, so where was I? Where was I going with this? Uh, the, yeah, this was about the ordinal thing. So, mm -hmm. so you are the Satoshi in in that specific Bitcoin address, but you're not the JPEG attached to it. Mm -hmm. Like you're not the. You cannot be the document. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you cannot be the arbitrary data in the time chain because the time chain only cares about the Satoshis. That's that's the where the game what the game theory is built on. Mm -hmm. So anything arbitrary you put in there is not a an extension of you while the Satoshis are. Mm. So so that's that's the key difference. And that's why I think Giacomo th sees it as unethical to just fill it up with arbitrary data and just making it more expensive for fun. Like Yeah, and I don't I don't actually disagree with that. Like if you're gonna make an ethical or moral argument, it's something like the I always go back to the hammer that you know you can do something constructive to build a house or destructive and like yeah. bash someone's head in. It's like I'm not going to make the ethical argument that bashing someone's head in is okay. No, but I'm also not going to outlaw hammers, right? It's no, like the no. tool like the tool is amoral. It's not immoral or moral. No, no, exactly. Um, and now this gets to uh, so all right. Action is premised on this idea of purpose, right? So that humans have purposes. 
and they're using means to pursue ends or to try and satisfy those purposes. What is purpose? Because now it's a strange, like when I look at a tool, for instance, it's almost like we have encoded human purpose into the material world, right? Like when you build that hammer, like there's a few different things that it does. There's purposes that it's good for satisfying and purposes that it's not good for satisfying. Well, that's also subjective. What is it? What is it? What makes something, I guess, how do we define purpose and how is purpose related to tools? Okay. So human action is purposeful behavior. That's one of the very basic axioms of praxeology. Mm -hmm. And purposeful in this sense means that it's purposeful to an individual actor. Mm -hmm. So it's not, uh, it has nothing to do with a general purpose or humans ought to do this or humans ought to do that. It's just what some individual found purposeful for their ends mm -hmm. at that point. So what happens in our brains is that we, we, uh, we're doing nothing and all of a sudden we feel a sense of uneasiness mm -hmm. and we want to rid ourselves of that uneasiness. So we imagine a state uh, in the future where that easiness is relieved and we also imagine a path there. So we imagine what means could I use to reach that state of less uneasiness than I have now. Mm -hmm. And that's all, what's go that's all that's going on. Mm -hmm. And th then we have this internal valuation hierarchy that makes us choose our most urgent ne uh, needs first at all times. So uh, if I'm more thirsty, then I feel the urge to tell you the next sentence in this interview, then I will choose to open the water bottle and take a sip of water instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and now that might, that might have been because I was thirsty. It might also have been because I was, you know, trying to illustrate a point right which is another end like the, right, the, the, right, right. this is this is complex like humans aren't simple like that yeah. but you can but you can explain behavior in these simple terms mm -hmm. uh, but it's important to not like put any subjective value on what these terms mean and to realize that it's all subjective right uh, from beginning to end which also ties into why there's no such thing as a homogeneous good. That's also subjective. Like, what, what, if, if I give you a bag of fruit, like, uh, that might be fruit to me, but to you, it's apples or oranges. Like, mm -hmm. we, we, we have, it, it's, it's also has to do with this linguistics thing that yeah. we define words differently. It's related to purposes. So, again, it, right? Yeah. And, like, if someone's paying you to bring them 10 pounds of fruit, well, yeah. you don't care if it's apples or oranges, but if it's 10 pounds of apples, yeah. you have to be more specific. Exactly. Again, it's 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 relative to the purpose. Yeah, it's relative to the purpose and and to the in acting individual's uh, definition at that specific point. Right. Because humans themselves change over time, yeah. and we don't have like at some point I w might think of something one way, and then later down the line I I change my mind and it has a different meaning to me. Yeah. So like, language evolves as well as well in this way. Uh, but I, I, knowing that that's the case, I think opens up a lot of doors towards greater understanding of why people do things uh, and why we're, why the world looks the way it does. Somewhere. Yes. Yeah, and a couple of caveats there. So one, all valuation is subjective, yeah. right? So whatever you're choosing, like what you just chose to do to take the sip of the water, Yeah. the only thing... I, as an outside observer, can say about that is you valued taking that drink of water at that moment yeah. more than you valued doing anything else in the world. Exactly. So you, you 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 execute every action at the exclusion of every other possible yes. action, and that's the only observation you can make. Right. And so, I can't say why. I can't no, say it was to illustrate a point or because you're thirsty or no, whatever. No. I can just you say that idea. at that moment you yeah. valued that doing that action above all others. It, and if, even if I tell you why I did it, you can't, believe you, can't yeah. you you can't know if that's true or not. Like sure. not to a hundred percent degree at right. least. You can choose to trust me more or less, but it's still action right. that that is the, the most truthful thing about human beings. Yes. Watch their behaviors instead of what they say, we get a very much a, a clearer picture of who they are and what their intentions are. Yes. And the other uh, part 
there's an exception to this and that's a very important exception is like all valuation is subjective except that man prefers present satisfaction to later satisfaction yeah all things equal right like if an apple now or an apple later yeah yeah i'll always take the satisfaction now versus later unless i'm compensated for the the deferment yes if 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 it's the exact same good of service, we, yes. you could argue that there's no such thing. Not even the same water bottle at the right. different times is the exact same thing because my relationship to it changes over time. Right. But this, what you're describing is time preference. Yes. And that everyone discounts the future somehow. Because, right. Like we, it's uncertain. Yeah. And the further off into the future you are, the more uncertain it becomes. Mm -hmm. So that ties into a uh, monthly wage, for instance. Yeah. If you have an employer and an employee, like in, instead of like it's often the case in the Bitcoin world that people choose to have like a share of the company or a share of the profit instead of accepting a steady wage. But what a steady wage can give you is a sense of security. And you, you have this, you know that you will get this amount of money uh, on specific dates. So you can plan, you can make economic calculation around that. And you can plan your your actions further into the future, and that whole thing breaks down also when when there's too much inflation and when well, when the money breaks, like mm -hmm. uh, so so inflation messes with all of this, yeah, because it makes all of this it it, it makes decision making harder for absolutely everyone on earth, yeah, because even even if there's only inflation in one country. If all other countries are so, even, you know, meta trading with that country or uh, yeah. trading by proxy with that country, that inflation in that country affects everyone on earth. Like yeah. whenever there's uh, counterfeiting going on, we, yeah. we, we, we mess with our ability to, to organize ourselves yes. in a civilized way. 100%. I, one of the ways I've thought about this is that money somehow allows us to extend rationality into the material domain. I would say that's what the pricing system is, right? If we consider yeah. that prices are exchange ratios between goods and services. Yeah. When you start to counterfeit the currency or inflate the currency, you derange that yeah. that process. So it's you're inhibiting the extension of human rationality into a pricing system, right? So it it doesn't we get we, we get signals that we can't interpret, right? I don't know yeah, if yeah. supply and demand or it's central bank monetary policy change. You're messing with the language. Yes. Because right. prices are like, like everything else, we interpret prices differently. Yeah. They mean different things to different people. Mm -hmm. But the more concise they can be and the more precise the rules around them can be, that like whatever yes. rules governs the, the, the monetary supply, the more robust that can be, the easier it becomes to use this language. Right. Uh, so, so I, I think that's very connected to what we're seeing now that other things in language get uh, their meanings uh, uh, um, distorted yes. by, by different phenomena in, yeah. in, uh, in uh, society today. Like we get this clown world thing because no one knows what anything means. Anymore. What is the woman? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, what is a Bitcoin? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the... There's so many things in the clown world that have, it, words have co completely different meaning. The word liberal, for instance, mm -hmm. it used to mean anything but what it is now. Mm -hmm. It used to mean a person that doesn't mess with other people's reality yeah. and tries to keep out and let the free market do its thing. Yeah. Right now, it's not that. It's yeah. very, very far from that. And capitalism, uh, it has also been replaced by everyone thinks that crony capitalism is capitalism. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the, right. the, the, it's just that the word has been diluted over time yeah. because something has been advertised as something it isn't. Yeah. Uh, and it's tragic. Uh, now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touchscreen. It's got a camera for air-gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. 
And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, the Gold Investment Letter. The Gold Investment Letter helps sophisticated investors navigate capital markets and maximize their profits in trading gold, silver, and mining stocks. The Gold Investment Letter seeks out the most undervalued companies and identifies special situations in the mining sector, and then provides in-depth analysis on both their financial positions and future prospects. The Gold Investment Letter explores many complex domains, such as investor psychology, portfolio management, and macroeconomic trends, all with the goal of making you a better investor. The Gold Investment Letter offers a free version and a paid premium version, and I strongly recommend you at least sign up for the free version, because after having read a few of these issues, I can promise you it is a treasure trove of good information. You can sign up for the free newsletter today at goldinvestmentletter.com. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happen. <laughs> now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. And it's this is in the interest of certain cohorts of people that want to confuse others, right? Or to keep the keep these topics mysterious or opaque such that they can maintain the scheme of Keynesian economics, let's say, things like that. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure I believe that there's a deliberate thing going on. I can't help but see, like, I don't know, deliberate, not deliberate, but it's the same state that bastardizes, bastardizes the money and messes with economic yeah. calculation and economic rationality that's also t- changing the, de- yes. using this proceeds stolen through taxation and inflation to change the definitions of words and fund these yeah. false ideologies. So it's like, it's the same impulse, at least. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, a, I would say it's a, it's a, the flaw in the system produces that. Yeah. But I'm not sure to which degree it's deliberate. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that the, even the creators of the Fed a hundred years ago had a clear concept of, of what their decisions would lead to a hundred years down right. the line. So, uh, and those are the people to blame because they set up a system that is inherently flawed and, right. and not built to last. So, 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 like, whatever we think about a, a certain movement in in people today, like, uh, if you take a a left winger today, I think most of them have the intention to just be as nice as possible, mm-hmm. and that that means not stepping on anyone's toes. So, all of this accepting. Uh, someone who says, I'm a squirrel, look, I'm a squirrel. Yeah. Like it's, they do it because they don't want to step on this person's toes. They want to be nice and it comes from Curtis society somehow. Yeah. But it becomes, the distinction is gone where, where you can you can tolerate something without approving it. Like yes. you, you can disagree with something. It's like we forgot how to disagree about stuff mm-hmm. because all disagreement is seen as hostile somehow. Right. And like, then we can't do argumentation anymore. We can't sure. do debate anymore. And then we only, the, the only way. Conflicts. Yeah, yeah. It leads to conflict yeah. because it's the only option we have left. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, um, maybe it was Whitehead said something to the effect like, our ideas, we let our ideas and words go to battle and die so that our bodies don't have to. Something like that. That's good. 
It's like once you stop doing that, right? If we're not going to engage in rational argumentation, yeah, then we're necessarily going to devolve into this physical confrontation. Exactly, and this this ties into the the old saying: uh, if goods and services don't cross borders, soldiers will. Yes, it's basically the same saying because right. goods and services are ideas. Yes, they're nothing but ideas, mm-hmm. and the, if we let the best idea win which we do through the market process. There's right. no other way of doing that because a, a trade is just a, a consensual interaction between two people. Mm-hmm. It's nothing but that. Uh, so so if we want to be civilized, we do things with consent. Yeah. If, if we let forces that disagree with that take over our lives, then we're doomed to conflict. Yeah. Yeah, the it's something like the will to power can be channeled into one of these two domains, right? It's if the the will to power goes into consensual trade, then we can both benefit. We can engage yeah. in a positive sum yeah. game through trade, division of labor, all these things. But to the extent we fail to do that, then the the will to power being kind of this human absolute, as in we all want to live, we want to thrive, we want to eat, we want we want more, right? We want to remove felt uneasiness, etc. Exactly. That it will devolve into the zero-sum game of combat. It's like, well, now I want more. I need to take it from you because we can't trade and create more. Yeah. And it's just a lack of understanding. Yeah. Uh, Lack of understanding, praxeology. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, So, uh, uh, what what am I going to say about that? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, the the power of the free market. Like... uh, we are we have a civilization today uh a, a fantastic civilization that we we can i mean we're sitting here in prague yeah none of us live in prague we, we came here by flying in yeah. a giant machine that inherited knowledge yeah and yeah. it's that's that took centuries to to realize that you even could do and then you have people everywhere putting the parts together within this beautiful city with a lot of history attached yeah. to it and s- stuff everywhere and the room to sit in and so all of all of those things are the results of deliberate human action and deliberate trading with one another. Mm-hmm. None of them come from armed conflict, right? Like, it, I guess every every thing we own and everything we buy. That if you look trace back history, there's a degree of theft and a degree of free market in everything. Sure, but the positives all come from the free market. Yeah. So so we're in this wonderful world where we are have all these wonderful things and can do all the can live these you know comfortable lives where we don't have to worry about much mm-hmm. in terms of survival every day. Mm-hmm. Uh be, despite government inf- intervention and despite inflation. Mm-hmm. So so that's the important thing to remember here that these are the forces for the destructive forces, these are the constructive forces. Yeah. Uh, and I think many people are so confused about that distinction because the people who benefit from the destructive forces or the people who think they benefit from the destructive forces mm-hmm. are very good at pushing that message. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and in the end, that doesn't work. If you look how, if you look at how Stalin died, for instance, mm-hmm. He died alone in his room, and no doctor dared to tell him that he was dying because of they were afraid of getting executed. So, like the Soviet Union was basically just a giant prison for for everyone for seventy years, including the elite, including like, Stalin. Yeah, yeah, uh, including everyone, because even the 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 people on the very top of that yeah. of that society had it worse than than you and I have right, right now. Like, so does this get to there is a an element of these social realities that we construct for ourselves that once we engage in immoral action, right? S- yeah. Stealing, killing, destroying, whatever it may be. Use really fiat currency. Violating the person or property of others, right? Yeah. Engaging in a non-consensual exchange. It's like yes. you, you said no and I did it anyways. Yeah. That introduces this element of immorality and when you build a society of that, you can cul- it can culminate in something like you just described, like the Soviet Union being a giant prison for everyone, yeah, yeah. including the people at the top. Yeah. So is, is this kind of pointing towards the moral dimension of human existence? Uh, I, I think... The, it starts to sound semi-theological, by the way. Uh, yeah. Uh, the thing is, 
praxeology cannot derive an ought from an is, mm -hmm. and neither can any other right. science. It's impossible. It's a philosophical dilemma that mm -hmm. cannot be solved. What it can do is point out that you can't argue for a certain type of behavior without uh, without running into a logical contradiction. Mm -hmm. And if if we take it for granted that argumentation is the peaceful way of resolving conflict and that violence is violence, mm -hmm. like, because when communication ends, there is only violence left. There is nothing but communication if we want to do stuff peacefully. Mm -hmm. So if you try to argue against that, you argue against your own, <laughs> like, uh, your own uh, uh, best interest, <laughs> right. and 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 it's self contradictory. So boils down to property rights. Like property rights uh, are, are an extension of the notion that we own our own body or that right, we're in possession right, right. of our own body. Yeah. So if we have an argument about whether we own our own bodies or not, uh, in order to de debunk that, mm -hmm. I'll have to use my tongue and my vocal cords right. and my, my lips yeah, to, sure. to, and my lungs to, yeah. to thereby proving that I, I am in possession of them. I'm the one right. deliberately using them. And a, any tool or anything else we own is just an extension of that. Mm -hmm. So, so arguing against absolute property rights, it's uh, you can do it, but not without a logical contradiction mm -hmm. somewhere down the line. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. But I think it's important when you talk about praxeology to not, to not, uh, you know, push any subjective idea into this. So, so my my like consensualist or anarcho-capitalist or libertarian viewpoints, mm -hmm. I'm not a praxeology. But I, I don't subscribe to Austrian economics because I am that way. I I uh, am that way because I've done the the, the work in in studying human action. Mm -hmm. You know, I come to the conclusion that this is a better way of conducting ourselves than than whatever interventionism could ever do. Like so so uh, it's, I view it as like the scientific way of or the logic way of of reasoning yourself to a position in ethics and uh that 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 you can live with yeah yeah it's, it's if the collective ends is human flourishing right which if you're a human presumably that's something you would want yeah you would want to flourish and have more options more wealth etc cetera, etc cetera, yeah then the only rational means to get there is a an ethical system premised on private property, right? Yeah. Not, not only just things that you own, but even like Habba makes a point, even if material wealth didn't matter, we would still need to have property rights just to determine who gets to use, like our bodies take up yeah. space and time. Yeah, yeah. That's so the, like the heaven were, example. Right. It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. It, it says the Garden of Eden, I think. We yeah. All of our, our needs met, we'd still need private property rights to determine conflicts of like physical who gets to be bodies. where war, uh, exactly. at what time yeah yeah yeah. so it's it's all about that yeah and it's another thing uh is that free speech only makes sense if if property rights have already been violated right uh, uh be, be, because if if we have absolute property rights then you get to say what whoever gets to say what on your property use yeah. the rules right uh which is because there's no such thing as free speech. Like, right? <laughs> it it comes at a cost always, so it's an illusion. And the same goes for like the word money. When we were in like talking about semantics and all this, like money shouldn't really be a noun; it should be an adjective, <laughs> if even mm -hmm. that, because every good and every service, uh, every thing has a moneyness to it yeah. and can be used as a medium right. of exchange. Yeah. So it's a quality, not a phenomenon per se. Exactly. So I would say that our speech now, your voice and my voice, are m acting as money. They have a certain moneyness yeah. to them since we're exchanging value with one another mm -hmm. by just talking. And and like so so I think a lot of that illusion that money is a physical thing that it's a noun mm -hmm. has caused so much damage to the human race. <laughs> like mm -hmm. we think it's this fixed thing. Yeah. And therefore, some entity can capture it yes. and, and start Zero printing time. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I've been 
doing the Atlas Shrugged audiobook. First uh-huh. time I've gotten through it. I'm about probably 80% of the way through the book. <laughs> I one of the, know, it's it's long and it's, it's tedious. 64 <laughs> hours, but it's yeah. so good. Like, it is. Her writing is unbelievable. The voice acting is extremely good. Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. But one of the points she makes in that book is that America was the first nation to make making money like a thing, like a phrase. Yeah. Whereas we we almost enculturated this idea of the positive sum game of of money and wealth. Whereas in the past it had always been about like what you, like you just described, you needed to go take someone's yeah money to to have more of it. But we can actually increase the purchasing power of money through work and trade and collaboration. Yeah, I I think even that phrase though it has a negative connotation now because now there's so many companies and institutions that make money right. by fooling people and right. not by doing anything productive at right. all, but but exchanging papers That's with right. one another and and just so they're not really making money; they're taking money, right? Yeah, they're they're making money by taking money. Yes, or like because you have to remember, like every time you use a fiat currency, you're stealing from your children. Mm-hmm. So, so like if you're if you're even hold a fiat currency, even hold fiat yeah. currency, I mean, yeah, spend it, just have no. It that's account. another yeah. use case, saving it. Yeah, uh, because saving is a delivery to you with yes. action. So, like, uh, so it's all. Uh, if you want to live by don't steal, uh, <laughs> that's extremely difficult to do Mm -hmm. because almost everyone needs to use fiat currency every now and then. Mm -hmm. So you can't, like, don't steal is impossible to live by in this world. Maybe it'll be possible in a hyper-Bitcoinized world, but, like, the vectors are pointing in the right direction, but still, it's a very hard thing to live by if you think about what stealing actually means. Yeah, it's not a fun thought, actually, because... You know, I have accounts. Depressing. Well, I have accounts with dollars in them. And then, you know, a lot of the work we talk about how all of the evils that are made possible through the dollar based world order. And it's like, well, if I'm saving in dollars, then I'm actually contributing to the reservation demand for that instrument. Yes. Which means I'm increasing the purchasing power of the dollar, which means I'm funding everything that the Federal Reserve funded US government is doing. You're playing their game. Yeah. And you're able to leverage their game because you're on that side of what's the saying when you're if a flock of people are uh, if there's a grizzly bear bear uh, chasing down people mm-hmm. you don't have to be faster than the bear you mm-hmm. just have to be faster than the the, the slowest Slow. person yeah uh, theory and, and that's what the Fed is like yeah. someone always has to pay and it's always the the poorest that yeah. pay and right. and it's very it's a brutal game to play. Yes. Uh, so, so, but with with Bitcoin, that's that's simply not the case. That that you you can't have the zero sum game if in a hyper Bitcoinized world, it doesn't work. The only way for someone who owns a lot of Bitcoin to to uh, uh, extract value from his stack is to spend the Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thereby giving them to someone else. Mm-hmm. So, th- so there's no there's no way around that on Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, there's no twisting of the rules. No, there's nothing. The there's yeah. no need for a finance sector. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All of that is redundant. Right, and this, it's a bit grim because, well, you're right, right? The Fed's going to prey on those individuals that are most profitable to prey on, which is to say the, the least expensive to tyrannize or steal from, the lowest hanging fruit, exactly. as you get, exactly. which is the poor, you know, yeah. people living on fixed income, et cetera. But then it's still... It just does not feel good at all to know that we're basically all complicit in this system. Like even no, the, no, uh, we did it to ourselves. Well, the purest oh, among us, right? We're like Bitcoin maximalists. We sit here and talk about the evils yeah. of shitcoinery and fiat currency. Yeah, as we do. Yeah, and I bought I, this for fiat with like, dollars, right? Without even thinking about it. Yeah, not with dollars. With this uh, whatever Czech Republic shitcoin, whatever, whatever shitty called. fiat is <laughs> the krona, right? So we're all shitcoiners. Yeah, we're all shit coiners. Yeah. Uh, uh, but w- at least we have the future accessible to us. Yeah. So, so we can tap into a, a bigger or smaller degree into this new system that is, that is not that. That is pure, that is truthful, that is fair. Mm-hmm. We, we, we can allocate more and more of our time and effort and our resources mm-hmm. into that thing. And the more we do that, the, the, 
the more we defund the old paradigm. Mm. And that's the beauty of Bitcoin. Yes, and, yes, yes. Moving into a new game. Yeah. And with the dollar, like, if you think about what the dollar is, uh, like, since it's the world's reserve currency, since oil is price in gold, mm. what, you know, the, the thing Jeff Booth talks about, like, whenever the Fed prints a dollar, they print oil. Mm. And they're making everyone else pay for it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, uh, in, in Swedish mainstream media and public service they call it public service where the public disservice is a better mm-hmm. name uh, uh media outlets they uh trump was always depicted as like the worst person ever because he was a such a greedy capitalist mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. Yeah. and what trump did when he uh gave out a thousand dollars to each american citizen uh, as as some sort of covid relief and funded that whole thing by printing money he he's not a capitalist doing that. He's a commie doing that yeah. because he's using, he's leveraging the fact that they have the world's reserve currency and printing more money and exporting the inflation to other currencies around the world. So he's stealing, pickpocketing out of every single citizen and the rest of the world yeah. to do a political cosmetical move. Yeah. And and Biden is the same thing. Like it doesn't matter who sits there. The politicians don't matter their incentives matter yeah and uh, right now like the the left isn't right and there's no right left mm. like the this the, mm. the, 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 the mm. it's either <laughs> you know just quit all of you <laughs> we'll be better off <laughs> well again all of the revenues are derived through theft and so you're almost like restating that core ethic of natural law which is do not steal exactly which is say do not be a politician. Do not no. be a statist. Do not be a bureaucrat. No. Um, you mentioned earlier, okay, you said that money is more of an adjective than it is a noun. Mm-hmm. I think that's what you said. I think it's Hay- Hayek that said that first. I okay. think it comes from Hayek. What does that mean when we... It's not a when, pronoun. <laughs> when we... That's good. When we corrupt money then, we're corrupting the like an an adjectival aspect of being human in a way like there's a quality of being human that's called money yeah this emergent agreement we have that lets us cooperate at scale cooperating at scale and then when you centralize monopolize corrupt that adjective yeah what does it do to us what does that mean for us like you, you keep saying that we are bitcoin right yeah 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 and it's 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 maybe belying a deeper point that we are like we are core operating components to whatever system of money we're a part of. Yes. It's like we're complicit in fiat. We're also complicit in Bitcoin. So what what I think about Bitcoin a lot of is like, not a crime though. I know, but as we <laughs> uh, Bitcoin's incorruptible money, yeah, so that's why it's potentially saving us in a lot of ways. But what I guess what I'm trying to tease out here is what is this connection between the corruption of money and the corruption of the human soul, perhaps. The funny thing about that, I, I think I'm going to answer that question in a roundabout way. Uh, so if you look at what, what Bitcoin does to you, like what does it do to your psyche? You now have an, an absolutely finite asset, which means that everything alludes to it going up in purchasing power over time. Mm-hmm. And given enough time, you like it can go up in value forever. Yeah. Which means that you're always incentivized to prioritize quality over quantity. Mm-hmm. And also you... You are uh, you want Bitcoin to succeed. Therefore, you're incentivized to help Bitcoin. Bitcoiners succeed yeah. and Bitcoin succeed. Yeah. So by proxy, Bitcoiners. So Bitcoin companies that are actually Bitcoin companies in their mindset, they're already on this standard and are not just doing Bitcoin to for quick fiat gains. Mm-hmm all have an incentive to not only engage in catalytic competition, but actually collaborate mm-hmm. and do things together and help one another. Which means that we're incentivized to just be more awesomer to one another. and Collaborative. Yeah, more collaborative and not backstab and do yeah. all these fiat things. Yeah. We're the opposite incentive. I view a hyper-Bitcoinized world as one divided by clown world. So it's the literal inverse oh, of everything that's going on. World, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, uh, so we're all incentivized to do that, and uh, it's and 
this is because Bitcoin is just an agreement on a fixed set of rules yeah. uh, that make and those rules make it harder to to cheat the system or, or more costly to cheat the system mm-hmm. than to follow the rules. So, but the funny thing is when you when you think about that on a deeper level, that means that since Bitcoin is only communication and mathematics, like that means we had this ability all the, all along. Mm-hmm. It was within us. Uh, it's just that we hadn't figured it out yet, mm-hmm. but it was always there. Like humans were always capable. Since we're capable now, we were always capable of doing this. Mm-hmm. It's just like the 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 the, the, the phrase I use is uh, the Beatles were right. All you need is love. They just hadn't found the correct equation for love yet. Mm-hmm. So so that's that's all it is. And if, if you think about what that implies, it's just insanely optim powerful and and positive for the future and mm-hmm. like we're 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 in real time experiencing some some paradigm shift or revolution of like unprecedented proportions because we get to the core of what it is to be human that mm-hmm. you you want to help others you want to you, if at the end of the day everyone craves love mm-hmm. in some shape or form it might be love from an audience mm-hmm. wherever you are or, or love from your spouse or love from your children or what but the the urge is when we interact with other people is that they will be pleased with who we are and what we do right and we get there by by being peaceful and not aggressive mm-hmm. and being honest and being all of this high virtue moral things mm-hmm. so uh yeah uh <laughs> well what was the original question because I had a, a uh, uh well it, yeah it was about how fiat corrupts that uh, yeah yeah like, the f- yes so so i think fiat has uh corrupted the, something deep in the very core of what it means to be a human being mm-hmm. uh and it it has done so by making it harder for us to find this piece of this this place of peace and tranquility mm-hmm. and and you know loving your fellow man like, yeah so that 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 was always present and was always there is it's just that we didn't know how to tap into it correctly right so uh uh you could view bitcoin as something that has it's if it's element zero you know that yeah. idea yeah so then it, it may have always existed it's just that the hash rate was infinitely low up until 2009 right 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 and there's you can't argue against that. I, I I heard that told as a joke, but it's it's impossible yeah. to argue against. Right. It was always there. It's just we needed to find this modus operandi that unlocks everything else. Yeah. And that was it. That was that epiphany. And some of us have found it. Some of us have realized yeah. what it is, and others haven't. That's really interesting. So does that mean that individually are our moral composition, our paths of character development are a consequence of the game we are playing, it sounds like. Absolutely. Right? Because if you're playing just fiat, you've got bad incentives to engage in more of this zero or negative sum game even. Whereas if you're playing Bitcoin, yeah. as you've described, like we're incentivized to compete but still collaborate and engage in more of a positive sum game. So then you get a whole different moral composition individually and collectively just Absolutely. by putting people into a new game. Absolutely, and uh, I mean, people are still. So this, is, this is a whole "don't hate the player, hate the game" thing. I, I, absolutely, that's what it is, and I truly hate that game, and I truly love this game. No. Yeah, because all that's the chess analogy. Like for the Bitcoin is like the rules of chess; they're mm-hmm. extremely hard to change without everyone agreeing on the change. And then in chess, that happened eleven hundred years ago, the last mm-hmm. time it happened. Mm-hmm. So, like, uh, <laughs> but it's it's absolutely that. Having said that, like. Individuals have a uh, different sense of morals and uh, are mm. <laughs> there's ethical people and there's more unethical people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if the game incentivizes unethical behavior and you know makes unethical people uh, rise to the top, yeah. uh, then that's the world we're gonna live in. We're gonna live in a world where people backstab and, and play these stupid yeah. games and we're not so what you can do on an individual level which is always where you have to start 
as uh, Michael Jackson said, uh, so if you want to change the world, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make that change. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, <laughs> it was right. That's that's where you have to start. And you can start like thinking about these things from an ethical framework and start changing your behavior accordingly. Mm -hmm. That's that's the path to, to better for everyone. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a coin join. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make coin joins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. And, and in our defense, like we have been trying to work this direction over the grandest arc of human history, right? Like, yeah, we've moved away from ancient pharaoh god kings in ancient Egypt toward individualized private property rights yeah. in the West, right? Yeah. We've been like working towards the Bitcoin ideal. Not only in the West, but in many places. Right, right. Predo led by the West. the West. Yeah. yeah. And so we have been trying to imagine this game into existence, but Bitcoin is like the, it's like the breakthrough or something, right? It's like we finally created the thing, the, the, the human social institution that humans cannot corrupt. So now we play this game and it rewards us for being honest, integral, collaborative, peaceful. Yeah. And it does not, you know, contrary to the fiat paradigm, it rewards the opposite. No. And there, this might not be entirely true during the adoption phase. Because right now you can mm -hmm. leverage markets and you can play the Bitcoin game in, in all sorts of immoral ways. You, mm -hmm. can, you can use Bitcoin to create a shitcoin and pump your bags there. You can spread FUD about Bitcoin in order to promote your shitcoin. And you can do all of this mm -hmm. immoral things. Uh, but but that is it's important to remember that all of that, the ordinals bullshit and the, uh, the, the, the craptos and mm. whatever it is, is a tr transitional thing. You can only play those games for so long. Uh, uh, the further we move into hard mm -hmm. Bitcoinization, the, the harder it's going to be to play those games. You can already see that because if you look at, like we, <laughs> we've had waves of shit coinery mm -hmm. and they usually coincide with a big bull market in Bitcoin mm -hmm. as well. And then everything crashes and Bitcoin crashes to like maybe 20% of its original, uh, like what, whatever it was before the the bull market. Mm -hmm. But all the other uh, shit coins just crash completely. Mm -hmm. And so so we're having this shit coin purge that sort of started with Terra Luna and then mm -hmm. FTX and all this. It continues now when the SEC is investigating uh, Binance and Coinbase mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, I'm against all government inf intervention, mm. but I prefer when in governments interfere with actual criminals than with, in mm -hmm. than with in innocent sure. people. Yeah. So so if you want to defend anyone, Harry, you should defend the taxpayer or just the regular guy using a fiat currency. You shouldn't defend these snakes. Yeah. Like, uh, so, so I view it as a purge of, of shit coins. And with every, with every, bull market successive bull market in bitcoin there's mm -hmm. there's a wave of shit coins and there's a perch and it's going to be harder and harder over time to to uh, to play these games and to to make money off of these scams mm. 
Um, right. It's it's kind of sad that they're still around at all, but you know people are confused, and there's sure. all of these shit coins have a marketing team yeah. to them, and like yeah. yeah, and there's a new crop of people every cycle. Yeah, to fool. It's always the next yeah. idiot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is unfortunate. I guess that's where the real utility of toxicity comes in. Is like just trying to warn people against all that, and it works to some extent, but most people just end up learning the hard way. Yeah. Uh, these derogatory terms like toxicity and even maximalism or mm-hmm. Bitcoin puritanism is mm-hmm. the latest iteration of mm-hmm. it, right? It's just like trying to put a label on a person that is refusing to play stupid games. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, mm-hmm. uh, because <laughs> the, like Bitcoiners are are the way they are because they've done the work, like mm-hmm. they, uh, figured stuff out. Uh, and it's it's not... It's not toxic. It's not mean. It's not like it. It has a very specific purpose, which is also why I'm, you know, because you you don't you agree to a certain degree with all people, and you disagree with some maxis as well because everyone's different, mm-hmm. and so so, uh, and everyone has their own version of what this thing is and what it can do and how to relate to it. And that goes back to the homogeneity thing. Mm-hmm. It, like Bitcoin is different things to Bitcoin to different people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, we'll, we'll just have to see it play out and see what it does and see if it works long time. It certainly looks like it works yeah. and that it's going to be forever. But uh but we don't know if we're if we're truly honest. We don't know uh, the longevity of it. But even if it goes to shit, even if it all fails at some point, the lesson learned from this experiment is just immensely valuable to humankind because we know what the problem is because, yeah. because we've seen we've seen that the problem is not unsolvable. Right. Yeah. I agree with you, but then I also feel like if it fails, we don't get a second shot. Mm-hmm. So it's like we could realize the problem, but then be incapable of generating a solution for that. Yeah, I which... push. I tried to put that in words in my second book yeah. uh, with something called the one shot principle. Yeah, it goes something like uh, uh, Bitcoin was a discovery rather than an invention. Mm-hmm. It cannot be discovered again by people aware of this inven- mm-hmm. of this discovery. Since the very thing discovered was resistance to replicability itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, s- s- right. uh, oh, it's absolute mathematical s- finiteness or scarcity in a sufficiently decentralized distributed network. It mm-hmm. was a discovery. Of- you can't reproduce it because it's absolute ir- irreproducibility. Yeah, that's what it is. That's yeah. what this discovery was. Yeah. The right. resistance to replicability, right. basically. And this, this, any attempt to replicate that is counterproductive at best yeah and but mostly it's just a scam right 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 um you said something earlier the beatles yeah all you need is love yeah and they may maybe they were right but they didn't have the equation of love yeah is infinity divided by 21 million the equation of love yes but on the other side like this is (laughs) on the other side of the equation is satoshi's equation this is what it equates to (laughs) Mm. satoshi's equation for the having yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful equation right so then what is the relationship between economic incentives and love are we saying that we're we're just saying the same thing about games again it's like we play a positive some game with unbreakable rules that induces us to be more loving towards one another yes wow (laughs) this is uh, that's what it is. If if we're not, what is love? Uh, is it, there's a My next podcast question. is what yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> what is love? Maybe it don't hurt me. You gotta have that theme song. That's, that's right. right thing. Yeah. Gotta have that one. Uh, well, let's say if love is the absence of hate, then and the absence of thereby the absence of violent behavior against one another, mm. then Bitcoin is definitely love. Right. <laughs> but, right. And I don't think you, with you interactions with human beings that aren't your children or your spouse, you don't really need more than that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Bitcoin is love in that sense. Yeah. Absolutely. It's fascinating. The other, you know, we use one word, love. The ancient Greeks use several. Um, eros, which is like consumptive love. Yeah. I want to eat 
the, I love the bag of potato chips or the steak. Like I uh-huh. want to eat it. It's kind of a one, one shot thing really, right? You eat the thing, you love it. And then there's philia, which was more reciprocal love, friendship, you know, family, you know, yeah. you don't want to eat your friends or your romantic partner. Some you want, people do. You, <laughs> sometimes you want an ongoing reciprocal relationship with them, right? Yeah. So it's a different form of love. And then the most powerful form of love, which is the one really embodied in the, the Christian tradition too, is agape, right? You, the newborn infant you bring home from the hospital, there's not even much reciprocity between you and the infant. It, it's just a, kind of an inert lump, yet you love that child more yeah. than any, you know, any friend, any family, anything you've ever had. And so that ultimate selfless love yeah. seems that Bitcoin somehow at least incentivizes or inspires that in Absolutely. Bitcoiners between Bitcoiners. Yeah. Like, and not to that extent. I'm not saying I mean, no. every Bitcoiner looks at every other Bitcoiner like it's their child, but there is this degree of selflessness that is induced by the economic schematic itself. So, yeah. Like you were saying earlier, like even if we're in direct competition, if we're both running a hardware wallet company, I still kind of want you to succeed. Yeah. Because it, it accretes purchasing power to my Bitcoin. Yeah, actually. And that's not a paradigm we had before that. Oh, no, no, it's completely yeah. different. One divided by clan work. Yeah. So, so yeah. The, the, one thing I think is very dangerous is the uh, a, a trying to love every single other human being somehow. Mm-hmm. Because that's always Jeez. leads to someone a, imposing their will upon others. Mm-hmm. So, like, we have to realize that, you know, selfishness is enough if we have a functioning free in the markets. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, because it 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 might not be love, but it it, it uh, enables people to live peacefully with one another, right. thereby enabling love. Yes. So so like this is what I mean with Bitcoin being all logos, and that is what allows for mythos and and pathos in mm-hmm. the word, right? Mm-hmm. Or is it ethos or pathos? You know this better than uh ethos, pathos, logos. Eth- yeah, yeah. Ethos and pathos. Yes. Yeah. Nothing, mythos is not a word. Right? Yeah. Well, well mythos is, uh, but it's yeah, it's about mythology. Yeah, okay. So uh uh well, like yeah. logos is rationality, pathos yeah. is um, emotional and ethos is Essex, ethics. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, well, and yeah, no, that makes sense because in a properly functioning free market, which only works with private property rights, yeah. right? It's a social cooperation under the social institution of private property. Yeah, my selfishness ends where your selfishness begins, right? It's the yeah, boundary yeah. of private property. Yeah, it's like, did you consent? Did I consent? Then it's a valid transaction. Yeah. If either of us don't consent, then it's it doesn't. There's no transaction. Yeah, and also like. When you buy something and you haggle with someone mm-hmm. and they look really, really disappointed when mm-hmm. you walk away with a good, mm-hmm. that's always fake because mm-hmm. the transaction they would not happen right. if the, 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 if the, the, the other know, party they could, they would have said no. happy about it. Yeah. Yeah. They could always have said no. So there's no such thing as an unsatisfied customer mm-hmm. right. <laughs> ever. Right. Right. Like uh, everyone. Well, you can figure out that the product was uh, sure. faulty, uh, right? You can in hindsight, but but, yeah. but what I mean is, like the the transaction itself doesn't happen if you don't have cons- a consensual right thing going on there. Yeah, yeah. Back to what you did earlier with a bottle of water. Like once you've consensually consummated the transaction, yeah, you have indicated that you valued having the thing that they had more than yeah, even- you had the thing you gave up. Even during the the moment that the transaction happens, yeah. that's that's where you know that you both agreed and you're yes. both friends, right? Like you, because otherwise it wouldn't have yes. happened. It's as simple as that. It's psychologically profitable to both parties to a transaction, exactly. When private property is respected, both parties believe that using this trade as a means to reach their ends is a good idea. Has reduced their felt uneasiness. I, uh, will reduce their yes. felt uneasiness when they when they consume whatever right. their service they bought. Right. So we have. It's the only only through consensual trade that we increase like aggregate satisfaction. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so damn simple, but it's hard to It's so at. damn simple, and yet it's so hard to see for people. Yeah. Because it's been veiled. Like yes. It's disguised. Yeah. Um, okay. There's a chapter in this book called Counterfeiting. Yeah. I haven't read this book. No. <laughs> Full disclosure. That. Um, 
and again, I'm very obs- semi obsessed with this topic. This is something I'm, I'm going to give my talk on tomorrow. Is like just the corruption of money and its consequences. Yes. Yeah. What is counterfeiting, and what are the consequences of counterfeiting? Counterfeiting is when a person or an institution or whoever prints more of a, uh, a commodity that is supposed to be scarce. Like, uh, so, so money printing is counterfeiting. There's no doubt about it. Like, that's what it is. So it's illegal for everyone else in society to print money except for the the banks and the central bank in the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all it is is counterfeiting. It's it's a sneaky way of stealing people's stuff mm-hmm. by diluting the value of their medium of exchange mm-hmm. over time. Which is why we see like house prices rising to absurd levels. The only reason that a house goes up in value is that someone's printing money. Mm-hmm. Houses deteriorate and there are more and more houses all the time, so they should go down in value. Mm-hmm. Well, though, that's that's the quick answer. And like Bitcoin is the only thing that can't be counterfeited. Right. And so what is that, like the, I keep coming back to the moral consequences of that. What is counterfeiting doing to us? Intrapsychically, sociologically, yeah, might, morally. Right. So the communication thing, it's, it's, it's hindering our means of communication. It's, it's making it harder for us to communicate via price signals. Right. So, so it's, it's, it's making language harder. It's mm. like a l- linguistic barrier that, that mm. affects everything. It affects every relation between human beings that there is on earth. Like it, it's, it's making everything harder. To, like, it's making it harder for everyone on earth to reach their goals, mm. <laughs> which is which is pretty. Uh, when you think about it that way, it's like the damage it does is just immeasurable. Yeah. Because if you have a business can grow exponentially. My my favorite example of this is in a farmer with an apple tree. And if that apple tree can satisfy the needs of enough customers so that he can afford a second apple tree the second year, he can double his business and do the same thing the third year and thereby buy four apple trees mm-hmm. and buy eight apple trees the, the, the fourth year and 16 apple trees the fifth year. So you have an exponential growth. If you have inflation so that the uh, value of the money that he uses to buy the apple trees with is diluted over time, he never gets to the second tree. So you're depriving every entrepreneur of the ability to have exponential growth in their business, hmm. which we can never measure. And this is why it harkens back to why, why empiricism is useless, because you can't see the trade-off. You can't see how much damage the, the, the printing does, because you're not living in the reality where it didn't exist, which would be a reality in which all of these exponential businesses were allowed to exist, just satisfying more needs of more people all the time, making everything cheaper, making everything more abundant, making everything more uh, of better quality, like mm. uh, all the positives you can think of when it comes to goods and services, which are everything. Like what we do is a good and a service. Like yeah. uh, all goods are services as well. When, yeah. when we buy a couch, we buy the couch b- because we want the ability Sitting to, to, to li- <laughs> lay down or sit down yeah. whenever we want to. Yeah. It's it's uh, an access thing. So like yeah. everything's a service, and uh, counterfeiting makes all of that way way harder than it has to be. And so we live in a world that's dominated by currency counterfeiting cartels called central banks. Yes. And they presumably are established to, as a means to the end of profitability for their shareholders. Yeah. And to, uh, and to their, they, their customer is the, is government, right? Right. So they exchange whenever the government wants to increase its national debt. Why, why such a thing should exist at all is just. Right bizarre they uh, they give governments bonds to the central bank and get newly printed money in return mm-hmm. and if you think about what a government bond is it's a promise from the government that they will uh, make more money than they're doing now in the future right. and how does the government make money stealing 
they steal it from there. So they're promising to be even meaner to you than mm. they are now and to your children, even meaner than that to your children. Yeah. And in exchange for that, they get the permission to dilute the value of the money you make. Right. So it's such a destructive spiral. Like all of it is just, and we're all falling for it and not seeing it for what it is. Right. Why is that? Because we're ignorant of the nature of money? Absolutely. We think money is a noun. Hmm. Hmm. So it ties back to that. Like, uh, as long as we view money as a, a a noun, I think that problem will always persist. And even deeper than that, I think every single problem that human beings have stems from the the wish that there is a free lunch somewhere. Mm. So, so nothing. if if you use your ten dollar wrench, it's probably fifteen dollars at this point in mm -hmm. the pod. Uh, uh, to to attack someone and thereby take their stuff, you're you're trying to you're give yourself a free lunch. You're expecting to get sixteen dollars or more. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And if everyone did that, we'd have no society at all. Yeah. So the, so the cost of doing that, even to yourself, is it's even a, of detriment to yourself because you you dilute your own morals and you in the end it will lead to worse outcome for everyone, including the thief. Yeah. So so. Yeah, so I think, but it's so tempting to take the free lunch that you think is there. Yeah. Because you think it's free, when in reality it's way more costly than to just do the work to right. afford to pay for the lunch. Right. Uh, and I think this ties into so many things in, uh, in, in that humans do. Uh, I know you might disagree with this one, but I think the notion of heaven is a wish for there to be a free lunch. If because as I view it, the, the scarcity of a human lifetime, that the, the, the notion that is finite and the acceptance uh, that you're going to die someday and there's going to be nothing, is what gives its value, its scarcity. It what makes your life a scarce resource. So that's why it's valuable. Mm -hmm. And uh, But if, you, if someone can tell you that, hey, there's a free lunch. If you do what I tell you, you'll get to heaven, then... <laughs> Then you you're in a problematic situation because this person uh, uh, chooses to believe that there's a free lunch because you could then you if you can fool someone that there's a free lunch you can make them do things for you in order to get a free lunch for yourself. So I think like regardless of any stances on religion or stuff, you, we can all agree that psychopaths have been using people's good faith. Yes, even it's if it's faith in democracy or faith in religion doesn't really matter. It always gets used by some psychopath that wants to steal the lunch. Right, right, uh, right and right. and the the reason that people fall for it over and over and over again stems from this wish for there to be a free lunch mm -hmm. and not being willing to do the work necessary to realize that the lunch isn't there. People love to get something for nothing, and it's exactly. not necessarily a bad thing because it's also the motive behind entrepreneurship. I think it's like you've got a problem, you want to solve it better, faster, cheaper. Yeah, like, but that's not nothing though. It's a, it's a, it's a the, well, and neither is stealing, right? It's not nothing. Like you're kind of taking a risk to go and mug a guy or whatever. So there's yeah. work attached to it. In yeah, some. quotation marks. But I, I just want to say again, it's morally ambivalent in my opinion. Like you could choose to try and get something for nothing by designing a new shovel that lets you dig holes faster, right? So now you get more holes with less <laughs> effort. Or you could go steal someone's shovel. Shovel, right? Yeah. So you, they're both pursuit of something for nothing, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing per se. No, uh, but I think the entrepreneur realizes that the lunch isn't free, but yeah. that he can get a cheaper lunch by providing value to others. Yes. So there's a key difference there. The 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 thief thinks the lunch is free because if he just attacks the other person, the lunch is free. I think but the sees the bigger picture. Like he sees that if he violates the rules of the game, the whole game is going to degenerate into zero sum. Yeah, and that's what the thief doesn't or the see. the thief doesn't see that. Or the government The thief just sees see. the, 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 the just take sees right the price, in his face. Yeah. And he doesn't see what taking the price will do to, to him. Yes. Like in more roundabout ways. And his children. And, and his children and all right, of it. Yeah. So, so that's the key difference there. Yeah. And we're all entrepreneurs, by the way. We, we all uh, do stuff to, uh, we're all entrepreneurs, we're all consumers, we're all laborers, mm -hmm. we're all, we're, uh, 
different stages in life, we all uh, engage in all of these different modes of being. Right. So there's nothing static about that either. We're all capitalists yeah. because we all save something. Right. Like, and you can't just get around this. And all of these different aspects of being a human being is necessary to make society function at all. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a great way to look at it. Um, it's fascinating. It, so, I don't know. It seems to me like we get in these deep rabbit hole conversations and money ends up being almost like a structural metaphor for the way reality works. Yeah. You know, like it touches all these different domains of human existence and it's, there's not real like fixed, discrete phenomenon in nature. It's this continuum. Yeah. Uh, you know, things are interconnected yeah, yeah. through change and exchange. As you were yeah, saying yeah. earlier with language, like there's a moneyness to our language. Yeah, yeah. We're using it as a medium of exchange of human conception. Yeah. Money more properly understood is like a medium of exchange of human action, perhaps. But everything in reality seems to be exchanging with other things in reality and there's so there's yeah. a moneyness to, to the nature of reality yeah absolutely and uh, as i said like when we view money as a physical thing it's it we're we're depriving ourselves of that insight like mm -hmm. we're, we're we miss a lot of opportunity because we don't see other stuff as money <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so i think we interact differently be under fiat paradigm because we we think that this is the only way we can trade, which is absolutely not. Like yeah. all you need is a bit of imagination. You can trade in all sorts of different ways. And some love. Yeah, and some love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're tied together. Yeah. <laughs> so this is great. All right. My takeaways from this conversation is money is an adjective, not a noun. Yeah. We are the games we play effectively. Yeah, uh, um, I, I wouldn't say you are your dollars, but I would say you are your bitcoins, because as a very the, the well, I'm the, saying if you operate as a a market actor in a fiat paradigm, like you respond to those incentives and your behavior and actions yeah. are less collaborative, more destructive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you you, uh, you fuel the fire of that game. Right. Like you're you're choosing to participate in some in an immoral scheme. We inherit the attributes of the money we use then. Yeah. If you, it's like yeah. deceptive, destructive. That's a whatever. good way of putting yeah. it. So so like the, that's the ethos of Bitcoin is something that's talked about a lot in this space. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's what that is. Like we we become more ethical because we use a system that doesn't allow for unethical behavior in the same way as okay. that the current system does. Yeah. Wow. If only more people understood that. Yeah. Well, yep. what we can do is this, is just tell people about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've kept you long enough. Good, sir. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we mentioned we're in Prague for Bitcoin Prague. Yeah, we're in yeah, we're in Prague for Bitcoin Prague, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Now, after this, I'm off to uh, to play Nirvana songs with Samson Mao and two German guys at the rock venue. <laughs> well, that sounds pretty cool. Here? Yeah. Oh. So that's going to be fun for Okay, sure. we'll yeah. have to check that out. <laughs> yeah. And people need to check out your book, Praxeology. Yeah. Have a look at it. And uh, if you've read it already, please leave a review. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, this really is Save the World stuff right it's like yeah. people just understand the nature of economics human action consent yeah and then we can literally save the world um exactly and ourselves and, and ourselves uh, the intention of the book is to write something more accessible than human action which is about a quadrillion pages long uh, very brutal read very good extremely good one of the absolute best books i know of and uh this is uh Intended to be a gateway drug into deep diving into these subjects more because there's so much value to be found there. Yes, there is. Indeed. Knut, thank you for doing this. Thank you, Rob. Where can people find you on the internet? They can find me uh, at, I'm at Knut Svanum on Twitter. I'm also on Noster. You can figure it out somehow how to find me there. And I have a webpage called knutsvanum.com and I do a podcast called The Freedom Footprint Show with Luke who's sitting over here. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're interviewing a couple of people here in Prague, and we've been doing the show since since Infinity Day, hmm. uh, once a week. So uh, yeah, we're looking forward to doing more of those and to to have conversations like these 
with other people. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, see you out there. See you out there.